what a magnificent way to go to a six. What a superlative exhibition this has been. And the whole of Old Trafford rising to its feet to acclaim yet another memorable, magnificent performance from Ian Bolton. It was the summer of summers for England, not matched, in my view, since the 1960-61 tied Test Series in Australia, and before that, 1936-37, when the Australians, 2-0 down after two matches, won the final three tests and the series. Then one man, Bradman, was more responsible than anyone else for the victory, and this year, 1981, one man, Ian Botham, made it all possible for England. There were many other contributions, marvellous ones too, from the rest of the England team. But uh, holding centre stage, for better or worse, throughout the summer, was Ian Botham. When Australia were poised to go 2-0 in the series, he made at Headingley a century that was sometimes lucky and always very, very spectacular. Edgbaston and Old Trafford, with his marvellous bowling and another brilliant century, were just as spectacular. But there wasn't an ounce of luck in either of those matches. The whole series became a marvellous fairy tale for England sports followers. It wasn't just cricket fans who were cheering both of them along. Sports fans, and even those little interested in sport, were swept away on a wave of national delight. Ian Botham was a hero. Well, they're short memories, eh? Well, perhaps they are. Because if you think about it, it was only 11 days after Lords that Headingley took place. And uh, if you have a look back at Lords, I don't know that we really would have expected a hero to have been accorded a reception of this kind as he walked back to the pavilion. Returns to silence. Was that uh, your lowest point of the year, Ian? Certainly a point I don't uh, want to remember, uh, or try not to remember too much. Um, yeah, it's, I had mixed views. I, I'd, made, I'd premeditated that I was going to, if it was out there, to have a go at the lap. Um, well, I was really interested in just quick runs, and I wasn't, a pair didn't really bother me. And uh, that's what I got. How long was the walk back? Uh, it got longer and longer. It seemed to be taking two steps forward and one back all the time. You, you rate yourself as being super optimistic. What were your feelings between then and the time you got to Headingley? Well, a lot of things happened here with the... When I decided to give the captaincy out resignation and I felt that um, there was a new page, now a new chapter, and let's see if we can um, write it in uh, a more acceptable way for myself and just take the games it came. Because I, I, had, I had confidence in my own ability, but, um, you know, suddenly I, I, I was getting very worried. Um, I don't know how you can put it, it's, it's, it's a peculiar feeling. I think anyone that's played a you know, professional game will know what I'm saying, but it, it's, you just wonder when, when it's gonna, the Wheel of Fortune is going to come back into your arc. <laughs> you, you're hoping it's the next game, and all I could do was hope that at Headingley, and I didn't even know if I was going to be selected for Headingley. Well, and when I was selected, I thought, well, just go out there and play. And even though you were selected, uh, things weren't too crash hot uh, after two and a half days of that uh, Headingley game, because when you came in at 105 for five mm. in the second innings, you still needed 122 to avoid an innings defeat. In fact, in some ways, that could well have helped me a lot because I went out then with the attitude of, right, well, there's, you know, it's, there's nothing to lose. Let's just have, give it a go and see what happens. And I think that could well have been the um, stepping stone I needed. Well, give it a go was uh, exactly what you did. Yeah, what a triumph for him it would be if he could still be batting at 6 o'clock this evening. shot. Allman pitching up again, inviting him to drive, and Ian Botham needs no second invitation. And that's a 
again, beautifully timed. It was back with a square, but it's four runs nonetheless. Botham's 27 not out, Dilly 10 not out. Here's Alderman. Four. It's a good shot too. Smashed away to the left hand of cover. shot and a superb piece of feeling to get to it from this uh, Yorkshire crowd who are relieved to see the home team at least putting up a fight here. And not quite where he intended, but it brings him his 50 nonetheless. His second 50 of the match and that broad smile Conveying a real sense of enjoyment. Absolute thoroughbred strength. This is what we were saying a little while ago. This is a perfect shot. He stays where he is, he doesn't pull that front leg away, and he hits it right in the middle, and England go into the lead.
And uh, they're looking for that, let alone chasing it. It's gone straight into the confectionery stall and out again. A beautiful hit. What a wonderful follow through. Only one slip now. It's a no ball and it's four. 99 to both of them. And that's as good as any stroke he's played all day. Them. 50 in the first innings, a century in the second and six wickets, a marvellous all-round performance to match some of the others he's produced for England and a marvellous tribute as well from his teammates, all of whom have gathered and Mike really is just giving him the word to stick around. Well, if he sticks around for too much longer, we'll be starting to think in terms of what might England's bowlers do on this pitch. His seventh Test match century, and he faced only 87 balls. 157 minutes, 1-6-90 in fours. It's his 14th first-class century. Safe in four. Orthodox but valuable. And up comes the 300 now. 301 for eight, and what a transformation. 104 to both and 25 to old. on that I think that he did and if so it was a desperately difficult chance yes no signal from the umpire so Rodney Marsh did very well to reach it and it's done more than revive Ian Botham's career it's positively revived this test series up on this scoreboard 123 ahead England last ball of the day the new ball will be due tomorrow and he's got the single he wanted so he'll have the strike in the morning this man who has become once again a national hero that was a great performance but you did need a bit of help from three fellows there Graham Dilley and Chris Old and uh, Bob Willis coming in at number 11 yeah, I was just, just looking at the end of that tape, um, running the last ball there with Bob. Uh, I don't know if you noticed, but he hesitates halfway down the wicket. <laughs> and actually, I was saying, go, 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 which was a, not the best of calls under the <laughs> circumstances. And Bob uh, later on said to me, so I wasn't sure if you were saying go or no, and we got the big shuffle. I think if the field had picked it up, we could have struggled. But obviously, yes, they, they made a great... Um, Graham Dilley played absolutely magnificently. When he came to the wicket, I just said, to, he said, what are we doing? I said, well, look, let's just enjoy ourselves and give it a whack and see what happens. Because he can strike the ball as well as anybody, as he showed. You know, and he hit the Indeed ball very, did. very hard. Well, 3.56 all out. And Australia, just 130 to win. That's almost nothing on uh, any sort of a test match pitch. First wicket to go down, Graham Wood. And 56 on the board mm. for just one. How was the super optimist then? 
Um, well, we said, we said before we went out that um, it was one of these wickets where we felt that if you got one wicket, you could easily get three or four. And if I remember right, we did. We got two very quick wickets. We got Kim Hughes and Graham Yallop very quickly just before lunch. And suddenly the whole format of the game changed around. And suddenly the, you know, there was a lot more pressure on them. And the wicket wasn't, um, I don't think you could call it a test standard wicket. And um, I think that showed with the, the ball that got Trevor Chapel out that got very big and very and went very quickly as well. Kim Hughes' bounce, Yallops. There was a... Quite a, you know, Bob bowled magnificently. He, well, I think the Australians christened him after that bustling Bob, who they steamed in, but he, he bowled magnificently. But he exploited what there was in the wicket. And by bowling that length, I think that's why he got the results. He bowled very, very well. OK, 74 to win. And uh, here is Bob Willis coming in from the Kirkstall Lane end. He's been switched from the football ground end by Mike Brealey. Steaming in now, and he's bowling to Trevor Chapman. <laughs> It really was a difficult delivery. He's gone, and there's not much that could be done about that. Trevor Chappell really had no chance. Very good piece of bowling from Bob Willis. The second wicket goes down at 56. Trevor Chappell caught Taylor bowled Willis for eight, and Dyson is 29, not out. Everything is running for both of them. Runs, wickets and catches, and the Australian captain goes for naught. Caught both them, bowled Willis. Hughes is gone, and it's 58 for three. Oh, good catch. Super catch that. Marvellous reflex action there. Yallop has gone without scoring. 58 for four with Dyson 29 not out. What a marvellous catch and what a great session for England. He's got a touch on it. He's gone. Going for the hop which he played so well in the previous over. But Bob Willis is extra pace. We're getting him a look at that uh, look of suppressed excitement on Mike Bray and other England fielders. But 56 to win. Willis to Marsh. In the air, Dilly is underneath it. And he's got it! A very, very good catch indeed in the circumstances. He didn't have much room to play with. Another foot and he would have been over the boundary. Willis has taken his fifth wicket. Sooner or later, Rodney Marsh had to go for the big hit. And... England are holding their catches just at the time when they need to. 74 for seven, Australia. Yes, he's got a touch and he's gone. Willis has taken his sixth wicket. Lawson out for one. And England on the brink of an absolutely sensational victory, which... Uh, is going to go down as one of the most amazing test victories of all time if it happens. Produced the wickets. Lily out for 70 in court, Gatting bowled Willis. Bowl him. It's all over. 
and it is one of the most fantastic victories ever known in test cricket history Bob Willis eight wickets a fabulous performance England have won this match after one of the most astonishing fightbacks you can ever see Mike I don't know quite what adjective to use. It has to be one of the most fantastic victories in all Test match history. You say that? <laughs> they say it too. I don't know. Ian Botham, they called him Jessup in the papers today. I mean, it was the most remarkable innings I've ever seen, I should think, in the Test match. The decisive over was the one that you bowled and got uh, Kim Hughes and Graham Yellow pad. That last over before lunch, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I told Mike I was a bit too old to be bowling into the wind, so I better bowl the other end. I, I checked out of the hotel uh, yesterday morning, <laughs> and um, perhaps that's the secret. When I talked when I talked to you Ian last night on this balcony after that superb hundred. You said, uh, well, if we can get another 50, it might be interesting. And in fact, you got another four or five, didn't you? <laughs> um, well, it made it even, that made it even more interesting. <laughs> interesting. Well, it still sends a chill up uh, my spine, even after all this time, and uh, I wasn't even playing in the match. Let's just take you back now from the uh, palmy days of Headingley to something that's not, not quite so pleasant. Losing the first test match of a series against the Australians. How did that feel? Um, I felt as it's a peculiar test match because I felt if we'd caught our catches, we'd have won the test match um, on reflection, but uh, we didn't and we lost. And I don't know, it was, a, it was a test match, a very peculiar test match. So I still felt we could win it on the last day. Well, let's just have a look now and see what you said to Peter West right at the very end of that last day after you'd gone down to Kim Hughes' side. How do you react to being made captain one at a time? It's a bit like being on the gallows, isn't it, in the big drop? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm not, I'm not uh, it doesn't particularly worry me. Um, I think uh, my family feel the pressure a little bit more than I do, uh, one at a time, but uh, I think I'm improving all the time as a captain, and uh, I th I'm think I'm hopefully things are starting to go I'm starting to get into more order with the bat and uh, the bowling I'm quite happy with so uh, hopefully if I come into a little bit more form then uh, that'll shut my critics up. So looking forward to Lords, you take an optimistic outlook. Oh, very much so. Yes, I, I, I've said all along I think this series is going to be very close and I think it's one that the public are, are going to enjoy very very much. Well, the luck and the catches certainly didn't go your way at uh, Trent Bridge, and uh, it was a little bit of a replica I thought of. Uh, that match against the West Indies where you first captained England the year before on the same ground and you could almost have won that. That was very, very close. But in that interview there with Peter West, you looked very, very happy. But what a contrast with the one we're going to show you now when you talk to him at Lords. Ian, we gather that you've told the chairman of selectors that you don't feel prepared to carry on as captain on a one-match basis. What was it exactly that you said to him? What I've just said to the chairman um, is that I feel um, that it's unfair on myself and on the team to continue on a one-match basis because um, I, don't, I don't know what's happening and the team doesn't know what's happening and I feel that it's certainly started to affect my game a little bit in the sense that I'm, I'm thinking about that at the end, you know, last day of a test match, um, what's going to happen. And I feel that it'd be better for me and for the team to know exactly what is going on and um, hopefully we can get on now and win the series. Had you and your colleagues, your fellow selectors, in fact, made up your minds earlier in the afternoon that you were going to make a change in captain anyway? Yes, we, we had made up our minds, and uh, the, for the main reason, we were a bit worried as to Ian's form. We felt that he's improving as a captain, but uh, over these last few months, he's had a rough time. I mean, he, he West Indies was a really hard tour. He's come back, and his actual form hasn't been too good. And I think that uh, his family has been harassed, everything's been harassed. So, so we felt that uh, it would be a good thing, perhaps, to, to give him a rest for a few matches, from captaincy, that is, and uh, let him get back into the groove again. Who do you think will be the new captain, then? I don't know. I, I, Who would you choose? I, well, in my view, the bloke, the captain that I feel is the best captain in this country, and... Uh, has been 
who I did played a lot of cricket under, and that's Mike Brearley. Well, that was a good choice. Have you ever thought of becoming a national selector? <laughs> no, I've, I've always admired Mike, and I've always felt that he's, um, that by a long way, the best captain I've ever played under. Um, I ca it's very hard to explain, but he seems to have this, he seems to bring the best out of everybody around him, and everyone, there's a willing, will, willingness to win, everyone wants to do well for him, and... I think we also have a great, yeah, you know, I certainly have a great deal of respect for him, and I'm sure the other players do as well. That's a tremendous attribute for any captain to have, if, um, if the players feel like that about him. I think that's the most important thing of all. Tell me, what changed your mind about the captaincy? Was it that long and devastating walk back to the pavilion at Lord's? No, uh, not really. Uh, the thing that really um, made my mind up, I think, was looking at the team, and the team, they didn't know who was going to be captain the next game. and. This is a very unusual practice in England. It's never, I've never known it before in a test series. And um, when I walked in and told the, the players that, oh, unfortunately, they weren't all there. Some had disappeared here, there, and everywhere in the pavilion. But when I actually told them what I'd done, there was about half a dozen of them there. Uh, it was just a stony silence. And that meant quite a lot to me, actually, in, in some ways. But it, it was a very emotional time, and I really just wanted to get in the car and get out of the ground. I'm not surprised. It, uh, it's both emotional and fairly numbing as well. Yeah, and it was also Kath was there as well, and um, suddenly the press were there with cameras and all sorts, wanting her to start saying things and photographs for her, which I understand they've got a job to do, but really I think it's a little bit unfair on her because um, she's got it. You know, it's like my son. You know, I, He's going to have a very hard job when he goes to school, as it is, yeah. without um, people expecting him to pose for photographs and do this sort of thing at, at the age of four. Um, no, I, I just felt... Uh, I think I did the right thing anyway. I'm sure I did now. There you are. <laughs> Ian, uh, Mike Brealey won the match at uh, Headingley as skipper, his first time back. But uh, even with all those attributes you listed there, you were still having problems at Edgbaston when we got through to the final innings because the Australians needed only 151 to win on a pitch where I think most people would think that they should have made those runs. Let's have a look now at how they approached the last day. It's 87 for two. John Embury is the bowler and facing him is Graham Yallop. And he's gone. Tremendous shout going up there, and Yallop goes, Embry has made the breakthrough, is it too late? That's the question to be asked. So Yallop goes for 30, four men out now for 87. Very well deserved wicket for John Embry. You see Graham Yallop comes down to push him through the onside, gets an inside edge onto his pad and it dollies up to Ian Botham fielding very close, short on the offside. And that's well bowled. Out of a bit of rough stuff there. Border is gone for 40. That's 105 for five, and no one in this match now will make a half century. Quite astonishing. And a very awkward delivery indeed, which, as you can see, bounces, flicks the handle or the glove and pops up probably off Alan Border's body. Five wickets left, 37 needed to win, and Brealey's brought both of them back to bowl at Marsh. Bowled him. 114 for six. Rodney Marsh goes, trying to hit it away, through mid on, across the line. 114 for six, and the crowd has gone noisily berserk. He's out, LBW. First ball and Botham's on a hat-trick. First ball, Ray Bright, it looked to me as though it kept a bit low. It also looked to me as though it was absolutely plumb. 114 for seven now. And this is incredible. comes in Botham and fires it in. It's a little 
bit short, but absolutely smacking through. far away from it either. Second attempt and Bob Taylor grabbed it. Lily is gone. It's 120 for eight. And you can see how wide that delivery was. And up she goes, out she goes, and thank goodness for that, says Bob Taylor. Both again to count. And is well there, and that surely is going to be it. A joyous, triumphant both of them. Arms aloft again, 121 for nine, and the man that they so much needed to see the back of, Martin Kent. Bowled by both of them, an inspired spell here. He goes for 10, 121 for nine, with only Terry Alderman to come. And who would believe it? Well, what value this crowd have had today. They've rolled up in their thousands today, and this is what they've been looking forward to seeing. Martin Kent whacking that through mid-wicket. Pitched just outside the off stump. Went straight through and hit the off stump. Hold him in face that's it this time, he's made sure he's taken five wickets, he grabs a stump, and another memorable victory for England. He didn't want to bowl, you know, didn't he? <laughs> he thought, I think, he, you know, now, he, he, it's just beginning to come back, the real confidence that he always used to have. He did not say he didn't want to bowl, but he wondered if other people shouldn't bowl ahead of him. And um, he came in, and he, now he's coming in really hard, and it makes all the difference with him if he's coming in hard and hitting the ground, hitting the bat. And I think he did it for a while at Headingley, and he did it again today. And it was a marvellous, marvellous flair. Well, from what Mike said there in that uh, interview, you didn't want to bowl. I read here in your own piece by Ian Botham that you didn't want to bowl. Do you think you would have come on at that precise moment had you been captain instead of Mike? Oh, I suppose probably not. Um, it all changed when... Uh, John Embry got that wicket. Alan Border. Yeah. yeah. And once, once Alan Border was out, then, then I, Mike was talking to me prior to that point to whether I should bowl. And I felt that what I would have done was I said the odd ball's turn. I said to Mike, why don't we try Peter Woody just for an over or two? Just a little bit of variation from that end and see if he gets any response. And then once, um, with John then getting rid of Alan Border in that over, then I, I, I agreed with Mike that I should bowl. But, uh, I wasn't too keen. The wicket didn't look like it had that much in it for me, <laughs> <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> well, it didn't have all that much in it for you because you only picked up five for one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I could have done with a little bit more, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> no. well, uh, we've been reading uh, a lot recently about uh, this guru-like figure, this father figure of yours that uh, you tend to class as a grandfather figure. What, what is the, uh, the relationship there? I, I, I don't know. I think, I think probably... I've, Mike, uh, I think, likes to have me around. I think it, um, he once said to me, he said, you bring out the uh, boyish instincts in me. Uh, <laughs> I'm not quite sure how to take that, though. <laughs> um, I think it's, it's a good relationship. It's a good working relationship because um, there's times when things can be getting very heated or something and I can do something ridiculous at slip, uh, which sort of relaxes Mike or he can, when we're in a tight situation, I'm bowling, he can give me a gentle kick in the pants. And it, it's it's a good relationship. There's no there's no friction there at all. And I think that, again that's very important. And that's probably a very key factor to the way things developed in this series. Just let me take you back to something you said there. Uh, he can give me a kick in the pants. Now I've been reading, I've been intrigued by the stuff I've been reading about the way you're being conned by 
your team members. We get him stirred up, mm -hmm. message goes down, Bob Willis or Mike Hendrick or someone gives him a stir along and the next one's fired in three or four yards quicker. What happens now that you know all about that, now that you know they're conning you? Well, actually, if anything, I play up to it more. <laughs> when things are going downhill or things aren't going my way, then uh, um, Bob Willis could be bowling. And I tend to quite often use it and uh, put, this, put the uh, foot near the shoe, so to speak. And I said to Bob, I said, well, that wasn't bad. I said, when are you going to let it go or something? Where's that effect? And it's funny, we, it's a good thing that's going in the side now, and that is everyone's geeing everyone else up. You know, I'll see perhaps Boyks down at Fine Leg giving me the gorilla sign or something. Come on, try. You know, and it, it's all very, very good because it, it gets you going, and it's good for team spirit. Well, it wasn't quite so good for the Australians at uh, Edgbaston, nor was it quite so good for them uh, at Old Trafford, where they were bowled out in some ridiculously small number of overs. But let's take you on now to Old Trafford, to where you came out in the second innings, and it was 100 for 4 for 5. A lead of 101, so in effect, it's 205 for 5. And you came out uh, to a standing ovation. Shades of Lords on the last day? <laughs> well, he's got two men back, a deep square and a deep long leg for Ian Botham, his first ball. And he's worked that away, he's off the dreaded pair. And that uh, will no doubt bring a huge sigh of relief, and I'm quite sure a big grin. There it is. Right again to Botham. And that's a good shot. And that's going to be Botham's first four. The first four for England since lunch. And only the second of the day. And really this match is crying out now for some of the belligerents that Ian Botham showed at heading. aggression from and uh, having played himself in he's now starting to flex those powerful muscles of his 13 to him now 128 for five Whitney to Botham oh and that is off the inside edge extremely lucky going for a big shot through the covers and a very thin inside edge Marsh having no chance of cutting it off with his left hand between the stumps and the wicket keeper. Yeah. And they mustn't give him room outside the off stump. Whitney to have to take. He's put it down. But what a steepler, what a terrible moment for a lad playing in his first test match. Dennis Lilly. In the air and six. That was a good hit because he was beaten for pace with it and he took his eye off it and still swung the bat and collected it over deep square leg. I'll need to have a look at the replay on that, but I'm sure that's the way it happened. In the air. And again. He's beaten Whitney and Wood away there at deep square. No hooking down there, safely into the ground. But once again, smashed behind square. And another bouncer here, and this time Ian looks at it, and he hits it right in the middle, and that goes for six, his second six of the over, and it takes him on to 48.
just not learning at all the Australian bowlers at Headingley they gave both them room to play strokes here they're doing it again and he smashed them for a quick 50 60 balls it's taken him two sixes and six fours and it's delighted this capacity crowd here at Old Trafford Chris Tapere has faced um, 242 balls Ian Botham has faced 66 so a reflection on Tapere who's um, doing quite a job out there in this match one up to be driven down the ground now that was just about the best shot both them's played today in the air for six he plays that shot very well it doesn't bother looking at it it just swats it away like a well as they is smashing a fly and this is another astonishing shot just watch Ian Botham's head He's not looking. But he still swipes it for six. And away over extra cover. Three, four bounces and over the ropes. The ball might be over the ropes, but the Australians are right on them at the moment. almost an action replay of that innings at Headingley although if anything this one seems to me to be better <laughs> dropped him I'd say that he got the hands to that didn't uh, Lilly's there uh, it's cleared him over the ropes what a magnificent way to go to a six what a superlative exhibition this has been and the whole of Old Trafford rising to its feet to acclaim yet another memorable magnificent performance from Ian Bolton 102 five sixes 11 fours in a tremendous whirlwind effort Down the wicket, big hit, glorious shot, all the way. Up go the arms, six more for both of them. And that six times he's cleared the boundary in his total of 109. Little bit of lift there and he's gone, caught behind, and the end of a truly memorable, magnificent performance by Ian Botham. 118, young Mike Whitney takes his wicket, it's another very simple catch, in fact, this time to Rod Marsh. But the whole of Old Trafford, you can be sure, will be on their feet. And they're going to applaud him all the way in, a reception he so thoroughly deserves. If you don't get him early, he seems to get hundreds. But he, he, he's so strong, that, and he hits straight. He doesn't hit across the ball too much, but he hits straight. Um, I think at times we've tended the ball a little bit short and look and give him a little bit of wit but I thought yesterday's innings was one of the, the greatest innings I've seen and by far away a lot better innings than he played at Henning although it was a different wicket completely but once he gets going uh, you know he, well, he could have been out Mike Whitney could have caught him you know me and sort of smash one way, way up in the air or something and it would have been a very very difficult catch but uh, if he had his middle dolly knocked out of the ground it could have been a totally different game but I mean that's the way Ian will play and whoever ever tries to change him should be lynched and uh, I mean, as long as Ian Botham, as long as you've got Ian Botham, England will have a chance of winning because of basically a game when he's played well, England have won. And it's been a long while since England have won games, and it's been a long while since Ian Botham's produced the forms he has in the last three tests. So really, uh, he should be put away and uh, treated very, very gently. I'm not quite sure how to take that, Clay. <laughs> I wasn't quite sure how to take it as well. I uh, don't mind the cotton wool bit, but uh, to be put away? Uh, well, it depends where he wants to put me. If he wants to put me on a desert island, then 
with the uh, full amenities were fine, but um, I don't know, perhaps he's thinking of one of those islands just off the north of uh, Australia. <laughs> he was talking there about um, uh, the innings you played at Headingley and the one at Old Trafford. Uh, which one do you think was the best from the technical point of view and the pleasure it gave you? It was both different, but I think the one I enjoyed most was probably um, Old Trafford. For the simple reason to me, it was um, um, almost faultless. Um, I think if Mike Wickney had caught that, it would have been a very good catch. And I, I was pretty confident when I started running those two runs there. Um, and also, you know, this little thing with, I have with Jeffrey Boycott about him always saying to me, will you go in and, you know, I've taken the shine off for you when you get in. And it was nice to go in and uh, start the onslaught really with the new ball. There is an article here that says, I want my job back. Do you want your job back? Yeah, I think um, eventually. I'm in no rush to get it back. It, when it, obviously, if it comes my way, it's not the sort of job you turn around and say, no, you don't want. Um, but when it comes my way, I'll be very pleased to take it again, because I think I've learnt a lot. And I've learnt a lot as well in these last three tests, four tests. And what about, with the things you've learnt there, if the job does come back to you, what about the family pressures then? Well, I think once you've been through the mill, and you've been, th you know, you've, and I've been through it probably at, from my own playing point of view, at my worst possible time, um, I can't believe that it can never be as bad as again. It's got to be better. Um, if it's not, well, I'll get out quick. And it just got to the point where I couldn't pick up the daily papers and turn to the sports. Oh, I think I've learnt a lot in this last year. In my opinion, a, a, a captain's performance that came one match too late. <laughs> because it really finished the match. Both of them. To me, the performance of this match, which was certainly the most spectacular Test Match 100 I've ever seen, a plus wicket, plus catches, Always in the game, Ian Botham is my Cornhill man of the match. But there's been one figure outstanding on this series, which I don't think you need me to say who. And uh, it's Ian, Ian Botham, we know him. Resources he can get hold of.